everyone. Welcome back to The Move, where we're vibrant through the book 10 minutes at a time. I'm your host, Justin Koo, and in today's episode, we're talking about the very first time in the Bible that incest and polygamy are mentioned. If you're wondering, what in the heck am I talking about? I'm talking about Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 to 26. My guest for today's episode is none other than Pastor Harold. Um, Pastor Harold, I have a bit of a confession as we move into this passage. I, I teased in this episode that, yes, it's technically the first polygamy and incest, and we'll get to talk about that all. But my confession is this, is that when I read this sequence, of verses, my immediate response is to kind of like gloss over, like my eyes kind of roll back into the back of my head and magically I appear at the end of the passage in Genesis chapter five. And I'm like, wow, that was a really quick reading. It's one of those, it's the very first passage in the Bible that for me, I'm just like, okay, I don't know what to do with this anymore. Like I I can, I can read the story of Adam and Eve and I can feel like I learned something from it. But when I get here, I just, I don't feel equipped to feel like, yeah, that was a meaningful time with the Holy Spirit. And like, I love Jesus more because of it. And I'm just wondering, those of you who have gone to get advanced degrees in theology, who have quote unquote mastered the divine when you get your MDiv or whatever the case is, do you guys read the passages any differently than us common peons do? Yes, we've been endowed with super intelligence at the (laughs) seminary. Therefore... (laughs) Nah, man. Listen, uh, <laughs> I think there are no. The only one that that allows to do that is is a spirit. Actually, when all of a sudden mm-hmm. you begin to unravel uh, some layers of the story and you begin to see things, the spirit is beautiful when 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 he does that to us. You know. Mm-hmm. So uh, going to the seminary and getting and mastering divinity is really useful, um, but discovering uh, more of of the love of God in the, in the scripture is, is only the work of the Holy spirit. Mm. Um, I, yeah, that was not, that was, I, I don't know how, how and why I got super preachy there. Anyways. Um, <laughs> no, 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 by the way, as, as, as continue down this rabbit hole and we're not, we're, we're going to get to the text. I promise. Why would, why would they call that degree something so seemingly blasphemous? It's such a paradox. It's like, yes, we have mastered the divine. And this is like, no. really? That's the claim that we want to have. It just, it just seems so bizarre. No. I know. I don't think it's, it's master the divine. I think it's masters, uh, you know, in, in divine issue, in, in divine things. <laughs> Okay. Um, I've met some pastors who, who come across like they have mastered the divine. <laughs> yeah, no, I've met those. Um, at some point in my life, I've I've even looked at him in the mirror and be like, yeah, "Oh no, yeah, right. no, that's 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 for another time." Okay, um, well, if you want to hear that story, you can go to Death to Life with Richard Young yeah. and hear Pastor Harold's story about how he used to be a master <laughs> of the divine. Now, yes. now he's fallen from grace, and now he's just here co-hosting a, a simple YouTube and podcast show. Oh instead. mercy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, you're not the only one that glosses over. Uh, sometimes that text can be very gloss overy, mm-hmm. um, and you can you can find your place because it's almost like you don't identify too much with the characters that show up in that text. It's especially when there's like ten of them in a row. Like if, if you yeah. if you introduce a new character, I don't think there's anything yeah. necessarily wrong with a new character, but it, at least there's space to kind of get to know this this man or this woman to get to identify uh-huh. with their victories or success right. uh, their, or their failures or whatever right. the case is. But right. there's just ten of them or however many there are in this list, and it's just like okay. Why is this important to the narrative? And and I know that for me, and maybe this is where we enter into this conversation. The very first thing I see is that Cain knew his wife. And I know that a lot of people, when they get to this part of the Bible, they're thinking, wait a second, where did she come from? Because we had Adam and Eve, and then we had, you know, the two boys. And then you start to count and you realize there's not very many options left in the yeah. in the genetic pool, so to speak. And it's like, yeah. what's going on? Is Is what's happening what I think is happening? Yeah, spicy. No, <laughs> no, kind of more creepy. Creepy. Um, yeah, it is creepy more than spicy. Yeah, definitely not spicy. It's creepy. But here's the thing, you know, you, it, it's sort of like, I, I think a lot of times what happens to us is we read things, um, um, we, yeah, creepy. We read things, that, that was really creepy. We're going to have to edit that out. So like spicy, <laughs> does, that, that spicy does not. There, there's no editing that's staying in the final film Ugh. or final episode. <laughs> <laughs> You're just gonna have to figure out how to recover from that, Pastor. Jeez, no, that's terrible. It is, it is creepy. Um, but it, it is, it is really the circumstances where you are. It's like there's no other, like there, there's, that's it. Like there's no other magical gene. That, and I, you know, you kind of wonder why God didn't like come up with like 
10 different at, from the beginning. And maybe that was part of the plan and then the plan got derailed. Mm. I really don't know. That's a question worth asking him. When You're saying like get... maybe there could have been Adam and Eve and then Bob and Sarah and then. Yeah. Jonah and and, okay. and Jose okay. and Maria, you know, there you go. something, <laughs> you know, like whatever. And, and then God have been like, all right, you know, y'all like go for it. But for some reason, there's only Adam and Eve. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I don't know. Maybe it has to do with uh, with unity. Maybe it has to do with the fact that we are all coming from one family. I don't know. But mm. the 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 reason is that there is nobody else. Mm. So interestingly enough, though, the Torah uh, eventually, once you get into Exodus and and uh, into the further books of the Torah, there's a very clear stipulation of like, yo, go beyond the immediate gene pool, guys. And even though, um, you know, monarchies have still been, you know, intermingling in very close uh, DNA relationships, um, clearly into the Middle Ages, mm. the Bible has been very clear already in the Pentateuch about, mm. uh, don't, there's enough of y'all around, go make those mixed babies. Okay? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Justin? Yeah. You know, you, you know? I know what you're saying. The U.S. is yeah, slow yeah. to catch up on this, that uh, interracial marriages are the best ones. Absolutely. I yes, agree. they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, they, so that there's a clear stipulation already in the, in the Pentateuch. Um, and it seems that it, it's sort of like, all right, enough humans, stop intermarrying, you know, mm. go beyond mm. the generations. So, yes, this is the first time that technically in the Bible you see that Cain is marrying or having a child with his sister. But mm. there is a genetic there's a genetic um, necessity. There is a there's mm. a completely different circumstance to it to just make it like, oh, the Bible is just a creepy book. Um, I think we miss sometimes when we arrive to those conclusions of just dismissing it. We, we miss the arch that the story is telling and the circumstances that the story is telling at the time. Hmm. No, I, mean, yeah. I, I guess that makes sense. So, so diving into the rest of this passage, there's several characters that are mentioned, Enoch and Irad and I don't know how to pronounce the right, L Lamech and all these different names. And yeah. by the way, you were telling me behind the, before we start recording that the Enoch mentioned in this verse is not the Enoch of notoriety later in the book. So that, that's, that's an interesting thing there. But there's several characters that it introduced and says that, oh, this person, you know, took care of tents and this person, you know, he played some music over here. This guy, mm -hmm. you know, he, he made instruments out of bronze and iron and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Other than just maybe kind of interesting anecdotes about where some of these industries, at least according to the narrative of scripture, have kind of kind of originated from, is there, is there a deeper meaning here? Or what's, what's the general thrust of this passage that we've carved out for today's episode? Um, great question. And I think that what, what happens is you begin to see just in the first verse, right? So in 417 says, Cain, Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and built a city and he named the city Enoch after a son. Um, God has given him sort of a, a penance, not a penance, but a, but a punishment. He's supposed to be a wanderer and Cain, Cain is still Cain. Right, mm. so in the first part of the of the chapter, Cain does the he murders his brother, he receives his punishment, but the whole thing was Cain just still being Cain and the fact that he's going to do something, mm. you know, when he shouldn't have done that thing. Mm -hmm. So he's going to build a city and he's going to live in that city. Oh, um, interesting. So the, the, even just the simple detail that, oh, he built a city is actually like it's going against the narrative or the directive of God. It's like, hey, go wander, go like be mm -hmm. about. Why? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't get to, we didn't get to talk about this in the last episode. So I'm actually curious about this. Why is that such an important directive? Is there any insight as to why wandering is important and not building a city? I don't honestly I no I wouldn't know what I do know is that he's given that order or that his that is his punishment mm. and I think that doing still has to do with the fact that it is what he does in the beginning because it mm. is it is his it is the work of his hands the the, the fruit that he brings mm. so he does he does Cain's going to do Cain mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Cain hasn't understood nor learned his lesson even after the tragedy that he is enacted upon Mm. And Cain's going to do Cain, you know, mm. it's sort of like us. We say, well, you know, if, if you, if you go through a really harsh punishment, you're learn, you'll learn your lesson. Not always, huh? Mm, not always. That's yeah. not really, no, you know, it's like this, a whole idea of like, oh, you know, eventually like, you know, after a certain time, maybe everybody can end up in heaven because they'll learn or no, mm. not the case. Cain's going to Cain, you know, mm. because that's, like that, that's that, just uh, how the. 
it's kind of like when people say that like, practice makes perfect. It's like, well, maybe not necessarily. If you're practicing the wrong thing, practice makes yeah. permanent, perhaps. Ooh, that's yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, practice makes very permanent. Yeah. Um, and so then you keep on following, and the other thing that you begin to notice is how there is seemingly a descent because you're going to look at this whole this this whole part from 17 to 26 is Cain's descendants because then you're going to go into chapter 5 and you're going to see kind of like Adam's descendants hmm. right um so Cain's line is a line that is pretty well it's 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 sad you know hmm. um and it's not that musicians or live tenants and livestock people are bad right but there's sort of like this working um you know, a theme that just goes into it. And then you, you finally get, uh, you get to Lamech who's, mm. who's like the epitome of, of just bad. He takes two wives, first of all, right. Lamech takes two wives and it's the same wording that is used in God took like, and took and gave Adam a wife. So Lamech mm. takes for himself now two wives, huh. which is, which was never the intent and then at the end of it, like in verse 23, he's actually boasting about the fact that he killed somebody for nothing. Hmm. He's he's not even like, oh, you know, Cain was a little bit of like, oh, am I my brother's keeper? He's still kind of hiding it, kind of like, you Shame. know, he knows that yeah. he hasn't done something right. But right. this guy is like, ha, brazen. Look at me, you know, yeah. like I'm 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 bad, bad Leroy Brown. I'm the baddest man in the whole town, right? And because I killed two men. You know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, for wounding me and a young for striking me like this, you know, some and and notice if we are talking about uh, if we're talking about relational closeness, mm -hmm. all these people are related. So right. this guy is literally killing a relative of his, a brother. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if he's married a sister, but then he's killed a brother, a, a, literally a brother of his just for wounding me and another one for striking him. Hmm. We're, we're not both... seeing, yeah, we're, we're not seeing the evolution of this family tree in in a very positive light so far. There's there's a lot of really no. sketchy things happening, and it's it's one thing to have baggage in or, or you know just challenges along your family lineage, right. but it's another thing for people to be really really proud about it. Yeah, and, and unrepentant. And, and exactly, he, and he's mad and repentant because then he goes and he says, you know. Um, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventyfold, and and you get that you get that echo back into like how many times should we forgive our mm. uh, those who offend us, Master? Uh, Seventy three times, times? Seven. Right, seven right. times, seven times seven. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So this 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 picture of like, man, if Cain was bad, well, I'm badder. Oh, right? mm -hmm. like look at me, you know. If Cain was bad, I'm badder. And and so you're seeing. I think you talked about how this is. I would. Yes, this is a. This seems to be showing a de-evolution. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. humanity, of what happens when humanity just completely leaves God behind, and that's why at the end of the verse, it's going to tie into Seth. And and notice again the irony of this whole thing is that Cain in Eve in Adam's uh, eyes, as they name him, hmm. Cain was supposed to be the solution to their problem because there had been a promise of progeny, right? Mm -hmm. And this promise of progeny was that there was going to be a seed that was going to be given and the seed was going to be uh, liberating. And and all of a sudden, you see that Cain is not only the one that is not the one that you expected. He killed yeah. his brother. Mm -hmm. And then his lineage is just savagely, you know, uh, de-evolution. Like it's just farther away from God. Right. Farther I away from the ideal that you could. This just has to be absolutely heartbreaking. Like I, I know that the kind of the the lifespan according to the Genesis narrative of humans back in that time is dr dramatically different than than what we experience right now. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm not sure in the chronology, but maybe Adam and Eve are still alive during this time, and they they still have this sense of hope and anticipation for for the one who's going to redeem them. And yet, what they're seeing is like their children literally at each other's throats like it, it reminds me of this time when i was i was maybe i don't know maybe in junior high or something like that my my dad my brother my sister and myself we were visiting i think um my, my stepmom's parents or something along those lines and we were playing some game outside in the driveway something something happened my brother and i got real pissed off at each other and my i think it was my brother I, I, the story might be different depending on who you ask who's through the first punch but 
<laughs> one of us punched the other one in the face in front of company. And, uh, you know, that's that. I mean, it's one thing to punch your brother in the face ever. And it's another thing to do it when people are around. And then my dad's like, what the heck are you doing? Like, how could you? And then, of course, you know, you just wait a couple of seconds. And then as soon as people aren't really thinking about what's happening, here comes the other brother punching the other brother. And I'm going to say in my version of the story, he threw the first punch and I just ended it. (laughs) And I just I just think about like how heartbroken would I be if I see Mateo do something like that, right? Like you just have all this hope for your kids and you want them to be, you know, productive members of society or fill in the blank, whatever thing that you're aspiring to. And yet in, at least in, in that one moment of my brother and I's interaction, we were quite, we were falling short, but we weren't murdering each other. You know, we weren't, we weren't murdering multiple people. And it's just like, man, like what would that have felt for for Adam and Eve? Because, because we have the context of living in a fallen Mm -hmm. world. We were born and raised in a fallen world. There's, there's, we know nothing else, but Adam and Eve, they experienced Eden. They experienced perfect. They experienced paradise. And to contrast that, to contrast the high of what it was like before the fall to seeing your lineage just destroy each other, that's got to be so painful. And it's got to be. I, I'm I'm thinking right now, not just painful, but um, the at least remorse mm-hmm. that they had because they knew it's on them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, like we brought, like, man, you know, we we were duped enough, right? That mm-hmm. this is what this is what we have now. Um, and I think they are still alive because right, that's where the text turns into an Adam knew his wife and Seth was born yeah right and i think that this is maybe the this is the glimmer of hope right now because it talks about how right after this this is when they begin to call upon the name of the lord and so there's this ending of hope there's yes there's this degradation there's this kind of spiraling into craziness and yet there's a moment where they realize hey maybe maybe there's a better way maybe there's another way to do this yeah that's uh it and and that is you know most most of that is seth is born um you know, uh, Adam knew his wife and, um, and it's kind of like a re- replacement for Seth. Um, mm. and this, I, I don't know if replacement, but it is sort of like this hopefulness, like you're pointing out of like new beginning, the, maybe. Right. Um, the seed has, the promise can still continue because obviously with Cain, right? Like that, <laughs> it can't be with Cain anymore. Right. Um, so here's, here's Seth. And, and the Sethite line. Um, and it's interesting that that, you know, began to, the people, it's sort of like this, this desire. Um, it, it's an interesting phrase in Hebrew that, that really lends itself to just sort of put people in there. It's sort of like, well, look, the assumption of the translator is that people, humanity, uh, started uh, proclaiming, invoking the name of the Lord. And, and it's not that they had forgotten but there's this one commentator um, who was one of who was uh, one of my professors in the back in the in the seminary, um, who who notices that the invoking is done sort of in a missional way, kind of like hmm. people uh, the Sethite line, I guess, uh, is 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 trying to remind the other line, the Cain oh, line, that there is, yeah. S- you you find you find this cycle throughout genesis of how humanity is always running away from god seemingly hmm. and god is always coming to humanity like even in the beginning of the story or in in chapter 3 it's god who comes hmm. it's always god coming hmm. right and it's us running hmm. so so there is this this interesting uh, line uh dr dukan uh, points it out in his in his commentary on how this is sort of a missional. It's not just like, it, it's not like a, how many you call it? It's not like a phrase or like a chant, but mm. it is it is a missional purpose of yeah. It's not just a, yeah. It's not just a handful of people like, oh yeah, yeah. We should we should start praying a little bit more. But it's more like no, no, no. Like we're gonna change society. We're gonna do better. We're gonna remember God, yeah. and we're gonna try mm-hmm. and and reform what's happening right now. Yeah, there seems to be that intention, at least by what he you know he points out that the. That the word, the, the yikra, the crying out, is is missional. It's sort of like in not just a chant, you know. So yeah, um, 
that's interesting on how there is this there is a break in the text and then chapter mm. five will start mm. with the line of adam and what adam's line is and then you're going to find the 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 characters that i guess we've identified a little better in the story but spoiler alert i ain't gonna tell you <laughs> Hey, if you're only listening to the podcast version of this episode, you're missing something really, really important. And that's what the words are on Pastor Harold's shirts. They say, get used to different. And I would love for kind of our feature at the end of this episode for Pastor Harold to talk about what exactly does that mean? And why is this something that you which you should care about? Oh, man, get used to different is um, this really wonderful phrase. Uh, there's a TV show called The Chosen. Mm -hmm. um that is probably one of my favorite tv shows bar none mm -hmm. um and the get used to different phrases one of their key phrases There's, they've got a lot of key phrases and this is the one where um jesus is calling levi matthew right it's a beautiful moment in the story spoiler alert you know matthew will become a disciple yeah. and uh, matthew is a tax collector and uh, jesus passes through the booth and he says levi son of matthew follow me you know and so peter's like yo what are you doing and he's like, well, you know, you're asking him to follow. Like, uh, you know, when you ask me, yeah, I get it. I, I wasn't the right guy, but 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 this guy, this is different. And Jesus looks at at Peter and says, get used to different. You know, <laughs> and and it's just this brilliant plug because in reality, that is really the beauty of the gospel. Yeah, is that you have to get used to different, and not just different in for different sakes, but but different in what what God actually sees might not be necessarily what the what the framework of 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 religion says so the chosen great mm -hmm. tv series it's an app you should go and download it it's free this is a beautiful part of it it's literally free so go to the app store the chosen and then uh download it and binge jesus watch jesus two episodes episode uh i mean two episodes two seasons and as of yesterday season three is fully funded Love so, it. oh man, I am ready for season three. It is just, and the cool part is like, you already know how the story is going to go, but you still love the, the TV app and the yeah. TV show anyways. You find yourself crying, relating to it. Go watch it. You will love The Chosen. One of the things I love about The Chosen is that this, I feel, is the beginning of the next wave. You know, for, for decades now, we have lamented uh, faith-based storytelling. Yes. Um, and I was actually, I was literally in an interview yesterday for a, a, a podcast that dissects film and then kind of tries to like superimpose it over the, the, the lens of faith, so to speak. And one of the things that they were talking about is how faith-based cinema has kind of been behind the times, so to speak. And I, and I really mm -hmm. think that this might be the beginning of the new wave. I think that this show pulls no punches it's exceptional in their storytelling and i'm not just saying that because jesus is in it because there's been a lot of films that i've seen jesus in that i have not felt the same way both in the the impact of the show on my personal life as well as just simply the the art uh, and the creativity and the the cinematic expression it's a fantastic show i think you would enjoy it it's it's one of those shows that we share with believers and non-believers alike and i think it's one of those great things that start conversations and uh, is a really just fun way to spend an afternoon so check it out it's called the chosen there's an app and it's completely free